My name is Jeffrey Borer. Uh, I'm from uh, SUNY Downstate Medical Center in New York City. I spoke about uh, the modifying effects of uh, uh, direct measurement of contractility of the left ventricle uh, on the prognostic implications of symptoms in patients who have aortic regurgitation and have undergone aortic valve replacement. It is uh, <clears throat> well accepted that preoperative symptoms are predictors of long-term postoperative outcome. It's also well accepted that preoperative contractility or left ventricular functional assessment uh, is uh, a predictor of postoperative outcome. But the interaction of these two factors really hasn't been known. We uh, assessed the data from 66 consecutive patients from our large and long, uh, long-standing prospective study of the natural history of aortic and mitral regurgitation uh, to uh, determine whether the, uh, uh, what to determine the nature of the interaction between left ventricular contractility uh, and symptoms in uh, predicting outcome after aortic valve replacement. The uh, findings were as follows. Uh, contractility certainly predicted outcome as we had previously shown in other populations and symptoms certainly uh, predict outcome. However, when we assessed patients based on their symptoms and their uh, contractility together, we found that there was a little bit of a difference. Uh, patients with neither symptoms nor contractility deficit uh, prior to operation did very well after operation. People with uh, symptoms, uh, w without, uh, with symptoms without a contractility deficit did a little less well, but did well. Uh, people with, uh, with symptom, uh, without symptoms, but with a contractility deficit, did a little less well. And people with symptoms and a contractility deficit did the worst. That was true for mortality, uh, for all-cause death. When we looked specifically at cardiovascular death, there was a subtle but, uh, but perhaps meaningful change in the results. Patients with, uh, uh, without, uh, without symptoms and without contractility abnormality did the best, as they had in the all-cause death group. But uh, the, the next best results were in people who had symptoms but didn't have a contractility deficit. Third on the list were the people with a contractility deficit without symptoms. And finally, people with symptoms and a contractility uh, deficit again did worst. The results of that analysis suggest uh, several things. First of all, uh, that contractility certainly does modify inferences about, uh, uh, about long-term post-operative outcome based on, on symptoms alone. Secondly, though, uh, the results suggest that people who have symptoms but don't have contractility deficit may have a good prognosis and that their uh, referral to surgery might be modified based on the contractility findings, not just the symptom findings. Uh, I, th I think that's the, the, major, the major point to be taken away from this is the importance of objective measurement of contractility. And remember that symptoms are subjective findings. Unless we're going to semi-objectify them by performing regular exercise tolerance tests, I think that it's not unreasonable to expect that an objective measure of uh, intrinsic cardiac muscle function uh, should be perhaps more important in, in determining outcome. The benefit of coming to meetings like this is that they're intimate. It's possible to interact with a large number of people uh, in, a, uh, in a congenial setting, and that's very important. I think there are 600 people at this particular conference, uh, which means that there are many people who may be working in areas closely related to your own. Uh, you have the opportunity to discuss and defend ideas among people who are thinking about the same things you are. Uh, and again, you can do it in a relatively intimate setting. That's um, a great benefit to people who are involved in 
uh, in investigative activities within cardiology or any field, it might be possible to do that at the large, uh, large cardiac meetings, the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology, the European Society of Cardiology meetings, but those meetings are so big that it is very difficult to achieve the kind of interaction that you can at a, at a meeting like this one. I've attended every one of these since 1993. Uh, I always come away with uh, uh, come away having learned something that I didn't know before by listening to somebody talk. I find that very valuable. I find it very valuable to have the opportunity to informally discuss with someone what I think and determine whether they agree or not. And if not, why not? Because it affects the way I think.